just the Facebook, you know, advertisement. Uh, it kind of like Bernie Sanders is running his, and uh, it, it, we're, it's a uh, Medicare for all. If you, you know, agree, hey, sign on for a newsletter, and then the next thing, well, would you like to donate? And the, the, the donation in this case would only go solely for propagation, or you know, propagation of the message to pay for to, to, to spread the message further. So if you get enough, you know, say one out of a thousand people, you know, I mean, I don't know what the numbers are. I haven't looked into it, but say one of a thousand people gives you twenty bucks, and that twenty bucks buys you another, you know, thousand clicks. You know, well, now you're sustainable. If you get two people out of that, well, now you just go and, and and on it goes. So if the message sticks and you get enough to push the message forward, well, all of a sudden it just it just goes. So either it goes or it don't, and that's why I say you got to take a really good first shot. Uh, because the bankers are going to come at it, like I, I told you, they're going to come at it with both feet because, well, it messes with the way they do things and they don't want to change. People don't like change. But they have to change uh, for, you know, for the good of all and so, our survival of our society. Because you already acknowledged that's a problem. Well, yeah. It's so, I mean, it just, do that. it just, uh, you know, it occurred to me when I, when I questioned that guy and, and uh, you know, as time goes on, you kind of put things together and it's like, there's someone that you could... You know, they, they would have to acknowledge it. If you get forced to, they have to acknowledge the problem. Uh, so now we have to create a public situation where the public is starts to inquire, hey, what about this? Is this for real or is this, you know, do we really have a problem and what the hell are we doing? And, uh, and, the, and I think the public kind of likes that. Uh, you know, like, oh, hey, look, I'm, we want to get in on this. So it's, it's got a possibility. Now, you know, we'll have to wait and see what happens. but. Uh, but I, I did definitely think it's a shot worth, uh, you know, taking, and I'm willing to throw some seed money at it, and then we'll see what happens from there. All right. So that's the basic concept. Great. Hi, I was wondering how implementation of the Need Act uh, would or might affect the euro the market for euro dollars. Yeah, that was a question that came up um, a few. I've got this. That was a question that came up a few conferences ago. Um, I think it was actually our friend Edgar that asked that. And um, so that night I had a quick look at Euro dollars and I found a paper by Milton Friedman that sort of showed about that. And um, I worked out some balance sheets. And um, my conclusion was that no, it wouldn't be effective because those um, their liabilities and banks and other jurisdictions and um, they're, they're tied to US bank deposits, but US bank deposits are unaffected. Well, the that was US bank deposits, well, if anything, they become more of a, a solid asset. So um, my conclusion was no. You know what's that? Or no bad effect? No bad. My well, conclusion was no effect, or no, no bad effect, or no, the euro dollars could not un undo the, the need act or the stability of US dollars in, in the US. Following up on Joe's uh, idea, uh, Google AdWords uh, gives nonprofits a credit of ten thousand dollars a month to spend on ads. So instead of you know trying to get it from people, you know, and, and the keywords would probably not be very expensive. Monetary reform, who bids on those words? So you can you can uh, you can have over a hundred thousand dollars a year of free advertising there, and reach people if they can get to the website or you know, give. Give money for other purposes. That would be great. All, all you need to do is be a 501 uh, C3. C3, C3 and uh, yeah, jump through a couple of hoops. I think uh, you've got to get very quiet. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. It's a for that. Following up on the uh, taxation question, Professor Tiedemann. now that uh, most uh, technological innovation and development uh, as a result of government funding. The issue is that uh, there isn't any give back. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of those, most of the revenue generated is uh, offshore. Uh, so is there any thoughts or, or plans about, uh, you know, if there is investment in research and development uh, plans for taxation or 
give backs from monies allocated and, and uh, given for development. Uh, I would say I haven't been thinking about that. <laughs> but so I've been thinking on my feet. Uh, it might be sensible to have government support be more in the form of loans or in the form of uh, perhaps bits of stock yeah. right. so that if something takes off, uh, you can get the government's return of its investment uh, and a lot more on the winners. I think that that would make more sense than taxation, which generally uh, inhibits economic activity. <clears throat> One of the things that the Need Act does is it converts all the outstanding money to U.S. money. And I'm not sure how this is going to affect these funds offshore or what they intend to do with them. They may have to bring them back. In order to get credit for it. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a very perceptive question, and, and we haven't, I don't think we've thought of it, like Nick said, I don't think we've thought that out yet. But it's going to make radical changes because the banks who loaned that money in the first place are going to want it back one way or the other. I was thinking about Nick Tiedemann's differences um, with MA and how, how to bring them, bring things together a little bit. And um, I try to be a purist, but I'm not, so I might not have a good interpretation. But just Is there to a question in that? Yeah, but it takes patience, Bob. <laughs> Jamie, do you want me to ask? Uh, wait until the end. Let other people ask the questions first. I'll wait until the end. I waited. I waited. I didn't see anyone raise their hand. It's a good question, you ready? Yeah. <laughs> it takes a thing, though. Okay. But one, Nick didn't say it. I, it please correct me. You have to hold the mic to the mouth. Okay. Nick didn't say anything about whether the Federal Reserve should go, it should be nationalized. But I'm not gonna work on that point. What Nick mentioned and, and how I, if I got it right, is Federal Reserve banking is wrong. And we need to change it. So that's at the crux. That's number two, we usually say. And, uh, and but on that reserved, uh, fractional reserve banking, it's wrong, uh, it perhaps by contract law, but it's, and it should be money in the vault. And then what do you do when you bring in all of these little people's monies? Uh, you, you put it in investment or you put it in savings account. And Nick is suggesting uh, Jimmy Stewart is dead, and that banks act as agents for mutual funds. So you, they, it goes into an investment account, either through the bank or with the mutual funds, et cetera. And, uh, <clears throat> and AMI thinks about the uh, transition process. I think uh, Irving Fisher was calling that the elegant solution at one point. And then the question is, and step three is money comes back into the economy, or you end up uh, back in 1837, things fall, fall down because money isn't coming back into the economy, so how do we do it? And one of the things, one of the hardest things I have in talking to people is they don't trust government. You know, politicians and the rest of it, there's a distrust. And I work with sometimes libertarians, and they have a distrust. And in, in one purist position, maybe Nick is suggesting here, is we don't give it to the government. Then, then what do we do? And Nick gave a way forward. And also Jamie gave a way forward. You know, 540 billion <coughs> per year of seniorage, well that's $1,700 per person. So let's think for a moment. Okay, every one of us, your, your, every family member, gets $1,700 in their bank account as a loan that they eventually pay back, that more money's put in it, 
on a nice regular basis in harmony, uh, not too much, not too little in, in the right way. Then, um, and then the question is, that comes back to is that Jamie brings up in his presentation, is what about the infrastructure? What about the transportation? What about how do you fund universities that aren't being funded now? So then the question is, is it okay to tax at the state level, municipal level, to get local transportation, to get the local bridges, roads, universities, healthcare at the local level? Is, then is taxation a proper role at the local level to do the things we need? Where, I'm trying to look at where's the balance and harmonies and, 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 and what was some purist thinking? Thank you. Uh, so quickly, I uh, think that probably does make sense to have the uh, Fed within the government. I think it doesn't make that much difference and it's not a high priority issue. But I think that in terms of uh, the, the question of whether or not they, they should be serving the public or serving the bank, they should be serving the public exclusively and not worry about making sure that bankers uh, are satisfied with their work. So I like the idea of uh, having the Fed and the government from that perspective. I think the main reason it wasn't done originally uh, it was to satisfy the bankers to some extent because people don't trust the public and somehow think the bankers can do a better job of it. Uh, and then, with respect to uh, how to deal with the, the, the lack of infrastructure, uh, I, I, some of you know that I'm also an advocate of land taxation. And one of the interesting things about infrastructure payments is that to a first approximation, if an infrastructure investment is worthwhile, it raises land rents by enough to pay for itself. That's known as the Henry George theorem. And it's, uh, widely talked about in public finance uh, So I think that one of the reasons why we do so poorly on infrastructure is because the people who own the land like the idea of getting their land to be more valuable and have other people pay for the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we would just say, no, it's not going to happen unless you pay for it yourself, uh, then maybe we get people to agree that they have to, that they ought to be paid for it by those who benefit from it. Or, primarily the owners of the land. Uh, I think, well, that'll do for now. <coughs> With the government issuing money, it is no longer necessary to tax the revenue. However, we cannot indiscriminately throw money out there, or we would run in, I think, eventually to the quantity theory of inflation which is utter nonsense under the existing system, system we have. <laughs> However, then taxes become a matter of monetary policy and how to keep things in balance. The genius of the debt system, if you can call it that, it is self-extinguishing. But it leaves this overhang of debt, which amounts to the point has already been made here, enslavement. But this is the policy that the monetary policy or uh, uh, standards that the monetary uh, authority will have to work out. Taxes are no longer necessary for revenue, but they will necessarily become a part of monetary policy, and that will have to be worked out. Now, there's a lot of resentment against taxes, but you have to understand if you want the benefits, you have to pay for them. I don't think that's unreasonable at all. I have another thought. <laughs> so I just would add as a response, um, I think yesterday I commented on the tax question and I am of the perspective that um, there, there's still a purpose for for taxes for the social good. Um, uh, 
and not, it's not needed for the infrastructure, it's not needed for public schools, it's not needed for all sorts of things, but there's maybe a, for the price of government, we, we, we pay for the good of government at the very internal level. But the point I wanted to comment about was um, Nick, after my talk, he came up and talked about the land taxation piece, and I, I'm very interested. I think Dan gave a great paper on, on you know, comparing the Georges and, and monetary theory. And one thing, so I need to learn more about it, but uh, Nick said it's not either or. It's, it's not instead of monetary reform. It's, it's um, something yeah. in addition. And the, the, so the piece of the monetary reform part is, and maybe Joe, he took the microphone, he might be addressing this, but he put together this um, layout of all of the states in our country and the population of them, and then the percentage of, I think, in the NEED Act, 25% of the money goes directly, funnels through to, to states and municipalities, and that, so he, he did the numbers on what that equals and amounts to, and, um, in, and then even after my talk, he pointed out for my little town, if, if, if the, the population is 125,000, that's uh, 36 million, 612, um, thousand, 82 dollars a year yeah. coming to my town from the NEED Act, I think uh, my public works director is going to be interested in that. And I did added up the numbers then for the top 10 states population-wise, and therefore money back through the NEED Act, um, it comes to 53, over 53% uh, of the population is represented just in those 10 states, and they include um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think seven states that we have represented in this very room right now. Um, California, is that represented? Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think we have anyone from Texas, do we? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's another one. Um, Florida, Michael Griffith would, yeah. is here in spirit, so he's from Florida. New York, okay. Illinois, yeah. Pennsylvania, my son is there, Dan is there, he's not in the room, my aunt's there, Ohio, yeah. not those Ohio folks, Georgia, okay, so we have to do some networking in Georgia. They just took a midnight train. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> North Carolina, <laughs> there, and Michigan. So nine out of ten states, the top Tennessee, I, I, you're down there, I don't know what percentage you are, but this was, so you're not unimportant, you're still on here. But I'm just saying, in terms of population of the country, we don't have yet a presidential vote where it's done, you know, that's what that percent, proportional right voting or something. But anyhow, uh, you know, that's a big sell, I think. Um, and I felt there was a real synergy between Joe's paper and what, what I gave in terms of working with municipalities um, and, you know, they're working across municipalities in a state and then across states. And we, so we can do this local work and regional work and national work in dialogue with one another, you know, build, building something. And it's, I, I, I think the land taxation, I think there's something there, and it's not instead of, it's in addition to. I remember my thought. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there should be a, uh, a, a use tax, or like a sales tax, uh, for those people who consume tax, and it could be made progressive, it could be scaled up for luxury items or whatever. And the reason the land tax falls short is that it does not include the mineral extraction, oil extraction, and something like that. So let's pay the tax on what we consume 
which is the product of the land and all the resources. <coughs> Okay, so Hold on, just, uh, Nick, Nick, I, I want to yeah. say that uh, I and people who uh, take my perspective often mean by land anything that isn't produced by human effort. So it does include resources, but it's also true that you have to tax resources on a combination of a value uh, tax of the value per year plus an extra special tax and the reduction in value from extraction. Okay, so this is, um, uh, I, I'm being real careful here because uh, I, I never like to disagree with anybody who I feel understands monetary reform, and I'm not disagreeing, I'm asking a question. And the reason that I'm asking this question is because I would, I, I come here to learn, first of all, and, and uh, and I don't like people to go away from here uh, without, without the right understanding about this. So, this has to do with whether or not the government can tax, it needs to continue to tax after, after monetary reform. Okay? So, what monetary reform does in the transition process is it creates permanent, a permanent money supply. Okay? All, the money, all the money that exists at the end of last year exists this year. All that money is United States money. So if, if, if that's true, then how can the government in the following year not tax and create this budget? Because this budget next year, if it's the same, would be $4 trillion. How can we add $4 trillion of new money and not tax people for the, for the rest of it? To me, it can't be done. It can only be done for whatever new money is, 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 uh, is, is uh, brought into existence to expand the economy, to grow the economy to what it can be to what it can achieve. That's a question for you, Bob. Can you re restate the question? Yeah, the, que the, 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 question is, the question is, can we do away with taxation? I, don't, I wouldn't want people to think that we could do away with taxation, that taxation for revenue is obsolete, or that, uh, or that taxation for revenue becomes a, uh, an option uh, you know, of, the, of the government to tax or not. You think it should be this? It has to be. I think it has to be. I think that the way the numbers work, you know that it has to be in there. <clears throat> I'll just preempt Bob a little bit. In our 32-page um, brochure, we have those 20 frequently asked questions, and one of the questions is, can, can this do away with income tax? And um, Stevens, you know, we, we talked about that a little bit, and Stevens' answer was that it could move in that direction, yeah, no, sure. but, but um, initially, probably not initially, it could move in that direction. I think that's the best answer you can give. Um, you know, we need to do a whole lot of analysis on stocks and flows. And um, I was just talking about this last night with, um, with a, uh, an economist friend of mine. And um, yeah, at the moment, uh, we need to gather a lot more information to look at stocks and flows. But my, init my initial um, <coughs> take is that on an annual basis, the amount of money that the government spends out, there would need to be some revenue as well as money creation. But um, yeah, okay. that's my view. Uh, but can we eliminate taxes? Unequivocally, not as far as I'm concerned. Okay, I thought you said that before. I thought you said it would be it was an option of the government whether or not they would continue to tax after we reform. Well, the if I said that, I misspoke. Oh, thank you. <laughs> We, um, we may be able to have a different sort of tax, not a tax on people, but a oh, tax yeah, no, on resources. What's, what's, what's like, the well, source? A tax on pollution, things like that. Right, exactly. Yeah, the consumer tax is just my opinion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can just make a small comment uh, just to get a rough estimate of how much money could be created without creating inflation. The Kumhoff paper says that in steady state you can uh, have the rate of growth of the money supply be about the same as the growth rate of the economy. So four trillion in a 20 trillion economy would require you to grow at one fifth, 20% a year, right. that there's no way. Uh, but uh, you know, if you're growing healthily after the reform at 5%, let's say, that's a trillion dollars a year of new money you can create. So you know, it's a significant 
Well, it's a tax cut. You know, the, the, the question of inflation is, Stephen stated, well, if you get something from the money, it's not going to be inflation. Right. If you keep these things in balance. Well, that's what the growth rate of the economy is. But you're raising another question. Exactly. Right. And that's the question of exponential growth. Mark, Mark. Okay. Well, we cannot, I mean, Kenneth Boulding said, only fools and economists believe that you can have exponential growth in a finite world. And I agree with him, except why the redundancy? Only fools believe that. <laughs> so, we have to, you know, in terms of the environment and extraction of minerals and use of all the assets, we, at some point, are going to have to to put a limit on it. Now, nobody's ever talked about this here because I think they're, you know, we're trying to promote the benefits of it. But uh, you've opened up a can of worms there. There is a limit to growth. And you keep, you know, sustainability is good, but I hear this oxymoron, sustainable growth. I mean, come on, it can't happen. You, you, if you, first of all, you have to look at the definition of growth, whatever that is. If you take it at GDP, uh, take a look at the studies of Ha Ju uh, Chang from uh, Oxford. And he studied all the South American uh, countries that, that were, were pushing money out there and creating a high rate of inflation, and they, their growth was higher. So you can't measure the monetary supply by growth statistics because it, it, it initiates growth. The more money out there, the more growth you have. So you have to do it only by inflation statistics and asset bubbles. This growth nonsense is, is undefined properly. And you have to be very, very careful. Uh, and it's called balance, whatever that means either, or equilibrium, what that means. It's strictly inflationary. One of the ways that inflation causes growth is by redistributing money from uh, creditors to debtors. Creditors tend to save and debtors tend to spend. And so you get more spending and then more and more demand for services. So that's one of the things that's going on. Another thing having to do with the possibility of growth is that we're moving from a good society to a services society. <coughs> and you can have a lot of growth in services without depleting your assets. And so that may make growth measured in terms of human value much greater than you might think if you're concentrated on what we on the stuff we have. Yeah, so the measure is inflation. After all. Uh, I think there are other questions, so I'm just gonna briefly say I think also after monetary reform, we will have the potential at least to have lots of exchange that is not monetized, that need not be monetized. People are working fewer hours. They are m making music, art, doing whatever they want to do, and a lot of exchange that need not. Doesn't hit the growth statistics, is what you're saying. Yeah. 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 Anyway. If, if, if I may interject here, I think uh, probably everybody in this room is concerned with sustainable growth. That's what Bob was talking about. In a finite world, you can't have infinite growth. And uh, can our ecosystem sustain the growth that we're having. That's that's the question. We're not talking about it, whether it's 10% or 20% or whatever the heck the growth is. The, the fact is that we're having species extinction now. We're polluting the air above. We're, we're, we're polluting our oceans. And that has to be remedied in whatever solutions we come up with. So maybe look at it as, as that way. And I'm not worried if the money's going up or the money's coming down or whatever. If, if we're going to change things, are we going to change things for the better so that there is life here in 50 or 100 years? Yeah, as I said, you have to have the five R's. Well, just might just make a comment. If I would think we'd want to concentrate on green, you know, you can have plenty of growth in the green industries, and that is, you know, yeah. good growth. You know, to, to, I think maybe a mistake is to assume that, well, we're just going to continue growing and we're growing. No, we can't do that. We have to have an environmental... You know, the civil know, engineers in their, in their reports and everything, and, and they went to this some years ago because I, I, I read the stuff, is they, they stuck that word sustainable yeah. in, in, in all of their stuff, and I think that's something that we have to emphasize also. Yeah. 
try. Just on the question of growth, I mean, I think at some point we do have to acknowledge this concept of limits and limitation and something that has not been factored into the whole equation but when we talk about that I think is connected sure we have money as a factor but there is also the question of energy and we have been living off the royalties of what a half billion years of concentrated sunlight that we have drilled down and utilized uh, the better part of just over the last couple hundred years that is Spurred this incredible growth, and I don't care what kind of alternatives are out there, it ain't going to be as easy. And as uh, Howard mentioned uh, before, to develop the technology of the solar panels and the like requires those kinds of uh, energy sources, oil and gas, and all that. There's limited supply. Limits. So the fact that you use energy more efficiently. But there, I, I, would it be an understatement to say we have a huge growth deficit that needs to be funded? I mean, we have a lot of people that can work, and we have a lot of work that needs to be done. And that initial funding, I, I think, the way I picture it, not that I'm any kind of expert about it, but, but the way I picture it is there's this huge deficit. We have so many people that could work, and, and so much work, especially infrastructure and green energy, that needs to be done. There's going to be a big boom. Okay, but and at, so, at some point you're going to have to taper it off, but it'll become self-sustaining. You're going to have the money out there, and you're going to have these industries going. And uh, but yeah. but there will be a big initial, you know, I imagine there'll be a big initial boost. You don't think so, Mark? The Congressional Budget Office they <clears throat> do an estimate of what they call potential GDP, and um, that's on the St. Louis Fed's Fred charts. And the last time I had a look, I think it was about 27 trillion, and I think the GDP was about. 18, 19 trillion, so it, it, I can't remember the figures, but it was a large, much more than I thought the difference. So I was meant to plot the two charts and work out the difference, but it was quite a lot. Um, oh, so, oh, I was going to mention a couple of things. First of all, in ecology, instead of sustainability, they're, they're now talking about regenerative. We need regenerative. Um, and, and I think when people talk about growth. What are the five R's? Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so when we talk about growth, a lot of us that are coming from a more environmental perspective, which isn't only the, the only thing we should be concerned with, obviously, but there is a, there is a, a limit. And I, as far as I'm concerned, there are a lot, there's a lot of growth that's happening economically that shouldn't be happening. Uh, you know, the idea of planned obsolescence, to me, is completely absurd. It makes sense. And even with our monetary policy, I think we should create a monetary system that... Um, doesn't reward creating products that are disposable, and and you know what I mean. So I think that needs to be in our consciousness as we do this. But, but we're, we're talking macroeconomics a little bit here. Is that um, is that you, 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 let, let me finish it all. Because we have okay. unlimited demand for money. Okay, we have a lot of things to do, and it's unlimited. Okay, including the good things, in which we have to make decisions on. So eliminate the the concept of growth because it doesn't mean anything. Think about what growth means, okay? It's GDP, according to the economists. Think about inflation. We want to put as much money out there, as diversified as possible, and go out there and do things. And all you're worried about is excess inflation. That's I, I, all you're worried about. No, I'm, I'm worried about the, the capacity of the Earth to be able to sustain itself. Right, and so the money uh, goes itself. to the five yeah, R's. I, yeah. yeah, 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 okay. But anyway, so the other part of it, um, um, my other question was, oh, and I, and I agree with you that there's a massive amount of economic activity that could be happening that's not happening because of an absence of money, and, and I think that can be solved through our monetary system. So, yeah, if you have an issue with the word growth, we can sit there and get into semantics about what specifically we mean. Mm -hmm. I think that you're, uh, maybe think I th I'm meaning something that I'm not meaning. Mm -hmm. But um, the other question I had, which was from earlier, um, was about taxation. I know there's a lot of people that that's kind of a, a major stopping point with them. And so, you know, my understanding was, and, and maybe you guys can explain to me how this works, because I always thought, well, gosh, if the government can create money, why can't it just create the money it needs for all the infrastructure? Um, and what would be the obstacles to that? What is the problem with, with the government just create, at least for like the government expenditures? Um, what is the problem with the government creating the money for its expenditures? Uh, I, I think most of us want a monetary system 
where money has a predictable value. And if money has a predictable value, then there's a danger of producing, of get, having too much money in the system. Uh, if you grow the economy, you can indeed have more money in the economy. But not you can't have as much money as you uh, would get if you just bought everything by printing money. Uh, you, if you have an economy in which people are richer, they, they want more money in their pockets. So you need, a, you need a way of estimating how much more money they will want, and having that much money and not more if you want to avoid inflation. I want to make one statement before I pass the microphone. I don't agree with the taxation issue. I, I think you can eliminate taxation. To me, you cannot at the same time tell me you want to spend three or four trillion dollars into the economy by giving a public credit or a public good, but yet I still need to tax. The other way to take money out of the economy is to reduce spending. It's not to take money from people. So I just want to put that out there. This is back to the conversation about growth and inflation and the earth's carrying capacity. And I might need to be corrected here, but my understanding is that one reason we love the NEED Act is because then the decisions about what projects to fund yeah, yeah, yeah. will be done more through a democratic process and it won't be um, for-profit banks deciding to always fund the most exploitative projects like the fossil fuel industry and whatnot. Correct. Uh, I got that right? Correct. Yes. yes. So then the next interesting, pardon me? Except they don't really fund it anymore. The next interesting question for me would be that particular transition of how implementing the NEED Act and having our processes all become more democratic along the way, that's going to get complex. And I'm curious to hear, maybe not today, but more conversation along that line. Anybody want to comment on that? Or? <laughs> <laughs> She's right about Well, yeah, I mean, obviously we need to improve democracy and participation. We need to improve our um, participation in democracy. Anyway. He's, got, he's got one on us. Yeah. To have the money spent on things that actually produce and therefore are not inflationary and don't create yeah. too much trouble with the environment. Yeah, if you're producing something of value, that, you know, then the, the value is in the, is in the thing you're producing. It's not in the money itself. The money is just like a measure of it. I love that. Yeah. I, I would say, um, Mary, that one, one thing we have to do is to do it within ourselves. And so AMI has not historically had, I think, democratic processes within it, and yet the spirit of democracy has very much been in the AMI. And we're also not limited to get permission from AMI to do whatever we want to do in monetary reform. And yet I think there is some big territory around the governance of, of AMI and around questions of being a membership organization. There's a lot of stuff there. And we need, I'm speaking personally here, um, we need to take that on as AMI um, or else we don't know anything about that we need to know to live out what you just described. I think there are a ton of other people, other organizations that know a lot more about democracy in practice than I do and that, that's not AMI's forte yet um, and so I think we need to learn <coughs> by doing and learn by you know going to people like Greg, who, or who has put stuff in practice, maybe other people in our membership. Um, but I think it's an important point that we need to do a lot better on. Yeah. Okay. So, do you want to say something? Well, <clears throat> the Congress is, has the power of spending in, in the federal government. Okay, that's constitutional. That's been upheld by the Supreme Court. I can't cite you the case right now. It was a long time ago. The Congress has full monetary authority. And there's another case, in 1935, Secretary Poulter, somebody, where the Supreme Court said the Congress cannot delegate its primary responsibilities, which is exactly what they did in 1791 and all through history when it comes to the power of money. 
And that is something we have to overcome. And that's the democratic agent of the federal government. And your local governments have their own power, states, counties, and cities, and you have to deal with them on a local basis. Yeah, okay, so this, sort of, this, this goes to the thing about about growth and about the green economy and, and all that other stuff and what we're doing here and what we want to do and what the outcomes that we want to see is to recall that all we can do is fix the money system. All we can do is fix the way money is created and issued and gained for the public benefit. That's all we can do. The, the, as, as Bob just said, and that only would include on an annual basis, the new money that goes into existence, and on the overall basis, the budget of the government, which is only 20% 20 20 of the economy. And the things that we're trying to prevent with the green economy is the other 80% of the economy, where the money is, is, is the destructive force uh, in, the, in our society, okay? That's in the private sector, if you don't mind me saying so. Okay, and what we have to do about that is to set a set up a government, uh, you know, uh, structure that that uh, determines and regulates what happens to the resources that that are, that are going to be out there in the economy. And we can do that after we control the people that are in the Congress. But we can't do that by fixing the money system. By fixing the money system, all we can do is fix the money system. Which don't get me wrong is the biggest thing that, and the most important thing that we need to do, but we can't solve all those other problems by trying to fix the money system. Those other problems are going to have to be separately dealt with. I disagree. <laughs> That's everyone. <laughs> There's overlap. Yeah, there's overlap. On the subject of growth, of resources, <clears throat> you know, uh, it, it also is clear that uh, you know, not only is uh, federally funded research and development uh, uh, innovations uh, given over to the private sector and all the revenue and, and benefits from those innovations are uh, uh, given to private organizations and offshore, but also the use of resources the exploitation of resources is privatized. Um, and on the question of taxation, you know, to me it seems clear that we have to make an effort to not only democratize money and, and the benefits of scenery, but also of, of natural resources. Uh, because those two things are uh, very linked in a, in, a, in a very real way. Right now, we have a system that privatizes the benefits of scenery and the benefits of the exploitation of natural resources. Um, but in a public money system, the scenery could benefit the public and also natural resources, use of natural resources. Well, if I might just to comment on that, yeah, it's all legal today. And that's part of the problem, is it not? And so the quest for the democratization of money, creation and distribution is part and parcel part of this larger, I think, democracy movement. And why, you know, it is what it is with the natural resources, with the, re with the research that's done publicly in public institutions that then gets handed over and it's the pharmaceutical, you know, maybe leading exactly. the way by accident? Of course not. By intention, again, because of the political influence. So at some point, we've got to incorporate the political influence, particularly from the finance uh, industry, in all of it. And just one fact I did not give this morning about the political influence of the banking and finance industry is the committees. And you may have a sense of this. House committees, the size of House committees, is sort of in proportion to the power of the House committees and their ability. Well, appropriations, they handle the money. Pretty important. Last time I checked was like 52. Much smaller than guess which one? Banking. Financial services. 59 members. And it was enlarged a couple years ago.